Hey everybody, welcome to the shop. I'm the Kinzu Kid. This is my Christmas light show marquee, and I'm going to show you how I built it. I designed this marquee after seeing some really fantastic work by Canis Pater Christmas and Future Tech Guy. I figured I might be able to combine some of their ideas into something a little more suitable for my audience. Because when the show ran last year, I met a ton of walk-up guests who had no idea there was music to be heard with the lights. Never, never mind the sign telling them to tune in 91.7. My neighborhood's loaded with kids, too, and they sometimes ask, Hey, when am I going to hear Dominic the donkey again? I needed something just a little bit better. So I set about designing a marquee that would allow me to better show off how to tune in, to enable the walk-ups to hear the music without a car, because who carries a Walkman anymore, to tell the folks what's playing now, and to give the viewers an opportunity to interact with the show, even if just a little bit. I'm pretty happy with the outcome, so let me show you what it does. Right now we're showing a simple element from a playlist running on X schedule that displays the tune to frequency and what song is playing right now. If I press this button here, the show will rewind itself to the previous song. And if I press this button right here, the show will fast forward to the next song. You might be saying, well, kid, I can't hear the song. Well, if I press this button right here, you can. The audio will come out of the speaker maybe for 10 minutes or so, and then it'll turn itself off. This button right here? Well, that's gonna do whatever I want. Maybe it'll fire off a snow machine or light up some bulbs in a special way, or maybe nothing at all. You'll have to try it yourself to find out. So if you're in the neighborhood, give it a whirl. The buttons are super mashable, so the little kiddos can go nuts without breaking anything. The panels are normally behind some acrylic glass that I've taken out for the purposes of the video here, but that keeps little fingers in the elements at bay. And the frame is made out of a recycled plastic compound, so it'll last me for many years to come. All the parts are pretty standard components that can be swapped out for others as needed, and the marquee is just a few great ideas other people developed that I mashed up into this monstrosity. We'll get to the brass tacks in a second, but first, a heads up. This is a kind of sort of build video. Really, it's more of a how'd you do that and a teardown explanation than it is a build video because nobody wants to see me solder 35 connections, lay up a bunch of table saw cuts, and caulk some joints to keep the water out. The videos I'll link to in the description will give you the step-by-step -step on some of the more complicated bits. If you have your own ideas about a marquee and you want a starting point to see what's possible, this is probably the video for you. Difficulty? probably intermediate to advanced, simply because of the skills needed to put it all together. First off, soldering. You can't assemble this guy without some actual soldering. Second, some basic electronics fundamentals. Some of the components like resistors, LEDs, and capacitors will need their values tweaked a little bit depending on what you're actually building and what other parts you gotta work with. Third, Woodworking and joinery. Familiarity with a table saw and how to create solid joints will be absolutely important. If you want to get fancy, a router. Next, Arduino and GitHub. You'll need to understand how to pull Arduino sketch code from GitHub, then customize and load an Arduino sketch to implement some of the interactive components. There isn't any actual coding required, but it will be helpful if you can look at the code and understand how to edit some variables like names and addresses without hopelessly breaking it. Watch Future Tech Guy's video for some details on that. I'll link to that in the description. Next, Raspberry Pi and the Falcon Player, or a Beagle Bone with the Falcon Player. To control the panels, you need to learn and know how to flash the micro SD card with the right image. You need to know how to work with the panels in the appropriate cape or hat for the single board computer. Next, X lights and X schedule. This entire marquee is predicated on you using X lights and X schedule. So you'll need to know how to configure buttons with an X schedule to respond to some of the interactive presses here. X schedule is an absolute must. And finally, Patience. If patience is a skill you have yet to master, your nerves are going to be tested continuously. I'll give you some comfort though. The problem is always something stupidly simple. Walk away, have a cup, and come back to it with some fresh eyes. 
Now that I scared you away, again, there are videos on YouTube and tutorials of all sorts in the forums that'll walk you through the step-by-step -step for things like setting up the Raspberry Pi and the Falcon Player, the Arduino, and even how to solder. Links to some of these are in the description, of course, and I'm not gonna show you all that right now because it would be a two-hour video that nobody asked for. Now, before I remove the back panel, I should note that the overall dimensions of the box are 29 and a quarter inches wide, 20 and three quarter inches tall, and four inches deep. I've already removed all the screws that hold it in place, so let's pull this back a little bit so we can see what we're working with. The back panel itself is made out of one quarter inch thick variety of a plastic called Starboard, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And it's held into place with stainless steel machine screws through the holes here and into these threaded inserts that I found. Now I put a lot more screws to hold this in place than are absolutely needed for a couple of reasons. First of all, 19 screws in the back makes it a bit of a pain in the rear end if anybody wants to tamper with the marquee. So any little bit of security is a good thing. Second, it adds some structural support and rigidity to the overall frame when assembled and in, in use, especially for this cross beam here. So I really like how it all turned out in the end. Now on the back side, you probably recognize this standard bud box vent. And on the other side of that bud box vent is a simple USB 5 volt fan right here that's driven from its power source in the USB port on my Raspberry Pi. It does a good job at keeping the box itself cool and helps prevent moisture buildup from fogging the inside of the acrylic face on the front. I'll talk a little bit more about how I'm handling the inevitable water intrusion when I dive deeper into the overall construction of the box. For now, let's get this fan unplugged and get a good look at the innards and what's going on. Okay, let's get to the guts of this thing and have a look inside. I'll show you the wiring schematic for this thing in a second, but that these guys are P panels of some kind should be pretty obvious. These are P5 panels. Each one of them has a label on them so that I know what supplier and lot I got them from. I always grab a couple of extra spares for replacements later, and I don't want a replacement standing out like a pizza cutter spare tire. The panels are being controlled by this Raspberry Pi right here with the Hanson Electronics Pi hat. The Pi is connected to the show network via this wired Ethernet cable which passes down through the bobbin out of gland over here. The Pi's only function is to control these panels and it has a lot of work to do. Wired Ethernet gives me the bandwidth I need to do just about anything I want. Text, crazy effects, video, whatever. And you can see I've mounted a fan over here to help remove some of that excess heat from the Pi. It works surprisingly well and keeps it under 100 degrees Fahrenheit even under very heavy load. Works very well. On the right here is an Arduino mounted to a project board so that I can run wiring to it from below down to these buttons that are underneath of it here. I attached the antenna on this board because the Arduino is connected to my show network via Wi-Fi and it's in a weird spot in my front yard. And without the antenna, it has a hard time connecting. The Arduino's entire job is to watch these buttons, and if any one of them is pressed, it sends a message over the show network to my X schedule server uh, to move the show along, to rewind it, or whatever. These are pretty small messages, and I'm not really sending any show data, so connecting to the Wi-Fi network this way works perfectly well, and the Arduino doesn't get bogged down. On the left, over here, you see the FM radio and a timer board. The radio connects to a speaker up underneath here, and the timer controls whether the FM radio here has power or not. The timer is wired to a button that, when it's pressed, turns on the power to the radio for about 10 minutes, then shuts it down automatically. I recycled this speaker and the grill up in the front that you saw from one of those cheap Bluetooth jobs that you get at a conference as swag or you could pick up for a few bucks at any discount store. In the middle are the power supplies, which get their juice from a line cord, also passed down through the bottom of the case and through a gland. This big guy is a standard 5 volt Meanwell power supply, and it does most of the work. It powers the Pi, the panels, the Arduino, uh, and the radio itself. The external vent fan that I installed gets its 5 volt power from the Pi from one of the USB ports. The timer board and the other cooling fan that's over here are actually powered by this little tiny 12 volt power supply that I recycled from one of the dozen of those spare charger blocks everybody has a bag full of in their closet. 
he isn't really doing much at all. He's only supplying a few hundred milliamps to power this fan and to power the relay on this timer. All of these boards are parts that you can buy online or recycle from other electronics. So let's take a look at the schematic so you can see how it's all plugged in. And first off, let's acknowledge that this is a terrible schematic. It gets the job done. It's about all I can say. Since we have two different power circuits, I have color-coded the 12-volt connections blue and the 5-volt connections red. These two circuits are not electrically connected in any way, so their grounds aren't tied together like you might with other circuits in your light show. The 12-volt power drives the timer's logic circuits, which tell it how to behave, and it also drives a relay to complete the power circuit for the radio. This channel 1 pin is connected to the positive 12 volt line through a switch, one of those buttons on the front. When you press the switch, it connects channel one to power, which triggers the timer circuit to engage the relay for a few minutes. If we look at the FM receiver board in the middle, we can see it's directly connected to the negative five volt line, but has to go through the timer circuit's common and normally open pins to get to the positive five volts it needs to turn on. The relay on the timer board makes that connection when we press the button and voila, power. The FM receiver board already has little 5 watt amplifiers built in so it's directly connected to the speaker and doesn't need a separate amplifier. While it is capable of stereo output, we only have one speaker so you can see that I shorted the ground and the mono pins to force the radio to deliver mono output. The antenna is just a length of wire I cut to size and soldered onto the radio board. The last bit is the 100 microfarad capacitor. I added that to account for the fact that these switching power supplies are super noisy and interfere with the FM radio. The capacitor cleans that noise right up and I placed it as close to the radio in the circuit as I could. Moving over to the Arduino, it looks like there's a lot more going on here than really is. The Arduino is directly connected to the 5 volt power supply and has three switches, those buttons on the front, and they're wired to some of the GPIO pins on the Arduino and then to ground, or negative 5 volts on the power supply. When we press a button, it connects that pin to ground and the program running on the Arduino senses it and does two things. First, it sends a message over the network to the X schedule server commanding it to do something. Second, it sends a little voltage out of the GPIO pin number two for a few seconds. That voltage on GPIO pin two passes through a 330 ohm resistor, then a little LED lights up on the front to let you know your button press was received and the command is being worked on. After the command is executed and the show does its thing, the LED just turns off. The resistor is there to drop the voltage so we don't burn out the LED, which only needs about 2.4 volts. As I mentioned in the caveats, the specific values of the resistor and capacitor we need depend on the specific components and voltages in play, so just use this as a guideline. Electrically, that's it. The marquee isn't terribly complicated, and links to all the parts are in the description below. Let's go back into the box so I can explain some of the construction. Now, the first thing that probably caught your eye if you've done any work with P5, P10 panels, or P-whatevers, is this wooden frame that I have around the panel assembly. These are just one and a half inch by three quarter inch pieces of scrap cherry I had lying around. For those of you in the civilized world, that's roughly four centimeters wide by two centimeters thick. I cut and assembled them as a frame to fit nice and snug around the panels so I wouldn't really need screws to mount them in place, but I'm using the screws anyway just to be safe. And these are the standard mounting tabs that you buy when you buy the panels. Let's take a look here <clears throat> at the top and see how the frame fits into the overall box. And you should be able to tell pretty quickly here that the frame slides into the box using this tongue and groove assembly here. And the tongue is one quarter inch on a side or roughly six uh, millimeters. And the groove of course is cut to the same length. The grooves are cut all around the inside of the box so that the panel assembly here inside of its frame sits snug and, and is held right where it belongs, as well as the acrylic faceplate that I built as well. I don't need any glue, and if I need to maintain it, I just pull the top off and I slide this guy right out and take a peek. The box itself is constructed of a material called starboard. Now, starboard is just a brand name of a high-density polyethylene 
lumber substitute. It's really tough stuff. You can find it at marine supply shops and there are many substitutes. You could probably even use pressure treated lumber, although I'm not sure how the chemicals as they leach out will affect the electronics. I'm using it because it's got obvious weather tolerance. We use it on boats and this stuff cuts and drills like butter. You could probably see I put a round over bit in the router here in order to soften up the front edges. I wouldn't want any little ones getting a forehead cut because they got a little too close to my marquee. Now there are two sizes of material here. The main frame, this stuff I'm holding is three quarters of an inch thick or just short of two centimeters. And there's a small panel down below here that holds the buttons and the speaker assembly and all that good stuff. And that's one quarter inch thick or about six millimeters. Cut into the sides over here and here, here and up here, you might see some mounting holes through which I will put some lag bolts. I'll drive them through there in order to mount the box to wooden posts. The fact that I've got the mounting holes on the inside uh, makes it a lot harder for somebody to steal this thing right off its mounting posts later. If at this point you are critiquing my joinery, join the club. I live next to a master cabinet maker and I just um, don't show them this video. You might be able to tell I wanted to secure the joints with pocket screws because pocket screws uh, are just provide an insanely strong joint. This material though is a little tricky to work with at first and I didn't have the experience that I do now and so I was had to give up the pocket screw idea in favor of the simpler but weaker butt joint. I'm using stainless steel deck screws <clears throat> through the top here and the sides in order to secure the entire assembly together. You'll see in a minute why that works out just fine. You might notice that all of the electronic components are mounted on standoffs. The power supply here is just using standard dollar corner braces and the boards are all mounted on the same two and a half millimeter brass standoffs that you buy for motherboards or your Raspberry Pi construction or whatever. This gives me a couple of things. First, a lot of clearance to run cabling and wires beneath them so that I can have a much neater finish and make it a lot easier to maintain. Second of all, it's an insurance policy. This box is going to leak like a sieve. There's no question. There's no way to make this box IP68 resistant to water intrusion. And sure, I'm going to apply caulking and other sealants to obvious points of entry, but water is going to get in, either through the bolt holes or through the joints or the back. Water is relentless. You can't stop it. So the key is to make sure that the water can get out of the box and doesn't harm anything along its journey. So by keeping the electronics up off the ground, anything that kind of sits on the step here really isn't gonna affect any of my electronics. But my secret weapon is that these grooves that hold these panels in place are cut all the way through the cabinet on both sides. And there are weep holes drilled into the bottom of the grooves on these horizontal facing panels so that the water has a way to get out of the box as easily or easier than it got in. I'm gonna let it sit a season and see how it goes. I'm pretty sure I'll see water in here and I'm pretty sure it won't be a problem, but if it is, I'll figure out where it's coming from. We'll put it up underneath the hose and we'll adjust next year and I'll let you know how we did.